Good morning and welcome to WIDA's very special event in partnership with the Asia Society Policy Institute to discuss what China's entry into the global EV market will mean for global auto markets in the as well as specifically in the US and the EU and around the world. Before we get to today's event, I want to highlight a very special event we'll be hosting with the WIDA Academy later this month when we hold our first AI and trade intensive trade seminar. We know a lot of you've heard about chat GPT and concerns about artificial general intelligence, but what does that mean for the trade community? We'll try to do a quick dive into the deep water of AI on August 30th to learn about these new, the newest developments in artificial intelligence and what it means for business and trade and the policy considerations for the trade community. Information on that event, event can be found in the chat and on our website, www.wita.org. As you know, if you've been on any of our more than 200 webinars since March of 2020, we like to call out the names of some of those you're in community with on Zoom, even if you can't see them. Today, we're joined by viewers in 27 different countries, including Lourdes Nada at the Tech Ent, Tech Ent Group in Argentina, Sylvia Chen at Egmont Trade Consulting in Germany, Justinus Dedica at the Innovation Agency of Lithuania, and Thomas Aquino at the Reed Foundation in the Philippines. Welcome Lourdes, Sylvia, Sylvia, Justinus, Thomas, and welcome to all of you wherever you are joining us from today. If you're watching this in real time on Zoom, you can ask questions of our panelists using the Q&A tab on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can toward the latter part of today's event. You should have also received a copy of today's event program by email with biographies of today's speakers so we can dispense with lengthy introductions. Uh, we couldn't be more glad than to have this amazing panel assembled today to talk about this issue that is much more complex than a simple new entrant into the EV market. Of course, this is part of a much larger conversation about trade and climate policies, which we'll continue to cover as part of our trade and environment series. But for today, the focus is on Chinese EVs. We have four speakers today who are new to the WIDA webinar platform and will bring an interesting perspective to the discussion. So welcome to Michael Dunn, the CEO of Zozo Go, author of the upcoming book, Humiliation No More, China's Master Plan to Dominate Electric Car Markets Worldwide. Welcome, Michael. Brian Janovitz, the Chief Counsel for China Trade Enforcement at the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. Jeffrey Kessler, partner at Wilmer & Hale and a former Assistant Secretary for Enforcement and Compliance at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And Hasuk Lee Makiyama, Director of the Center for International Political Economy. And he's coming to us today from Singapore, I believe. So really glad to have you coming to us. Uh, big time shift for you. So thanks, Hasuk. Um, so welcome, uh, uh, Michael, Brian, Jeff, and Hasuk. And of course, a big welcome to today's event partner, Wendy Cutler, Vice President and Managing Director of the Asia Society Policy Institute's Washington, D.C. office. No one has been a better partner and collab collaborator with WIDA since we started online programming in March of 2020 than, WIDA, than Wendy and Aspie. We hosted weekly webinars for the trade community throughout the first five months of the pandemic, and she's been a frequent guest in the months and years since. Thank you, Wendy, for everything you do for the trade community, for your friendship and partnership, and for moderating today's discussion. Well, thank you, Ken, and thanks to our panelists. And thanks also to our viewers. Um, we have such a large turnout and for an event early August in Washington, I was quite stunned with the number of um, RSVPs. Um, many of us were surprised this year when the first quarter data came out and China surpassed Japan as the largest global exporter of vehicles. And of course, many of these vehicles are from US and European and other foreign affiliated companies, but increasingly Chinese homegrown companies that have benefited from years of government support are also getting into the export arena. And in light of their high quality, the wide range of their offerings, including high end, but also very affordable cars at somewhere between 10 and $12,000, and their dominance in battery and critical mineral sectors, we can expect these companies to become major players on the international scene, undoubtedly presenting challenges for many of our car companies. 
And as Ken mentioned, we're also at a point in time when the effects of climate change are becoming increasingly real to all of us, making the transition to EVs a policy priority for many governments around the world. So today, this more, we're gonna examine some of these trends and challenges focusing on the US and EU markets. And again, as Ken explained, we've got a great team here. So let me stop talking and start talking to the panel. And first, I'd like to turn to Michael Tun, who's just an incredible expert on all things China EVs. And I have to say, I'm just going to put a plug in for your podcast, Michael, because I found that yesterday. It's called Driving with Dunn. And if after this webinar, you're even more interested in this topic, there are a lot of excellent podcasts um, 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 that Michael offers. So Michael, let me start with you and maybe you can share with us your thoughts on the state of play in the Chinese EV industry and market. In particular, like in particular, what's going on in the domestic market? There seems to be kind of a competitive shakeout between companies. And how are they viewing export markets, you know, US and the EU, but also in the developing world as, as well? Over to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Wendy. Yeah, yes, when we think about China's automotive manufacturing industry today, picture a colossus, picture a modern day Godzilla with the power to trample on and destroy anything that gets on its path. Uh, some numbers that are relevant. One, China manufactures one of every three vehicles on the planet. One in three happens in China. Two, as you said, China is now the number one exporter, exporting to more than 100 countries, including into Europe, South America, Southeast Asia, Africa, the Middle East. Actually, the only market we're seeing where Chinese have not yet really begun a big assault is right here in the United States. So this is kind of misleading for a lot of Americans. Hey, uh, we hear about these Chinese threats, but where are the Chinese cars on our roads? When are they coming? They just only need to step outside of the United States, go to Mexico, Malaysia, uh, Germany, and you're going to see evidence of more and more Chinese vehicles on the road. Well, let me then just follow up. Maybe you can just talk a little bit about the, the top Chinese car companies, particularly BYD, which seems to be particularly active um, and a formidable competitor. That's right. BYD is in a class of its own, um, accounts for almost half of EV production in China, more than 3 million vehicles this year. They're the number one player at home and they're begun exporting globally, including into Europe. What separates BYD from the others is that they have, over the course of the last 25 years, built up a formidable battery business and battery supply chain business. They own the minerals the mines, the processing, the battery manufacturing. And recently they began to uh, hire top level designers from Europe to design and engineer really good looking cars. So it's no longer a case of, oh, I'll buy Chinese because it's more affordable, it's low cost. These are just recently, I had the opportunity to drive BYD vehicles here in California, the Tang and the Han, an SUV and a sedan. Guess what? $70,000 for those cars. And BYD is making no apologies about that price. They're saying we can compete globally with other brands. We have the quality and we have the cost. We have the scale. So BYD is far and away the number one company to watch. And then just to name two or three other ones. Second on my list would be Geely. That's a private company that 10 years, 12 years ago now bought Volvo. They have subsequently also bought Lotus, the premier British engineering mark. Um, they've developed a new brand called Polestar, another one called Zeker. So Geely has a wide range of brands that's also shipping globally. They'd be the number two company to look at. After that, you have a powerhouse state enterprise called Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation. Their number one brand is, guess what? MG. Wait, MG, that's Morris Garage. Isn't that British? Yes, the brand is British, but they bought the brand from the, from the British about 15 years ago and have had a renaissance. So if you go to London today, I guarantee you're going to see MGs on the street and those MGs are coming out of China. So those are your sort of big three, BYD, Geely with its brands, and then SAIC with the MG brand. Those are the big players to watch. 
And Michael, before I turn to others, can you just um, share with us your views on why these, why the Chinese homegrown companies have not started exporting full force to the United States? Is it our high tariff or the fact that these car companies would not be eligible for the um, export credits under the IRA? Yes, uh, absolutely. I'm sorry, the consumer credits consumer under the credits. IRA. Yeah. Absolutely. That there's no question that Chinese automakers actually have lots of operations here in the United States. They want to enter the U.S. market, but there's two formidable hurdles they need to clear. One you mentioned is the tariff wage. Tariffs, 27.5% uh, on cars manufactured in China. That's much higher than any other country faces. Second, because they don't have local content, they wouldn't qualify for those subsidies here in the United States. And third, when I talk to Chinese companies, they say the climate is not right. Political climate they're talking about. There's too much tension in the air. They want to wait until things settle down before they really make their move into the United States. Okay, well, thanks. Let me now turn to Hosek because that just opens up the question then. These car companies do seem to be very interested in the European market. And we are seeing um, exports of Chinese homegrown vehicles increasing, recognizing that still exports from foreign affiliated companies from China are still the dominant export um, force in Europe. But is Europe concerned with this trend? And are there divisions between member states and Brussels and member states on how to address this challenge, particularly in light of um, Europe's environmental objectives, which call for like a ban on um, combustion engine, engine vehicles by tw 2035. Well, let me try to break down the question in a little bit smaller parts, perhaps. Um, well, where do I start? Well, as someone who worked on our EU East Asia FTAs, I can only say that auto used to be the most powerful trade lobby of all industrial conglomerates and all the state-owned enterprises that are actually in the European auto, indigenous auto industry. We forget that actually Volkswagen and Renault and many major power players are not just national champions, they're also SOEs. And they account for about 10% of all the employment opportunities we have in Europe total. So it's a huge, powerful lobby that had the privilege of actually asking for both market access and protection uh, in previous challenges that we faced from East Asia, uh, like Japan and Korea. But I would like to argue that actually Europe's attitude to China is slightly different. And, and maybe not in a way that many of the listeners would actually expect, because sure, I mean, China is the third largest uh, uh, exporter to Europe. Uh, if I look at the, the, uh, the foreign uh, exporters into uh, the European market, and they are soon about to reach 600,000 units, and that's about five, six percent of the market. But we have to remember, most of them are actually Teslas. And uh, yeah, and the other, the rest is actually Volkswagen brands like Volkswagen itself, Audi, uh, we have Audi, and we have also Cupra, which is a spin off of the, um, the Spanish Seat brand that Fox, uh, Volkswagen purchased many years ago. And um, yeah, as Michael mentioned, uh, Volvo has been taken over by Geely, and they have co developed Polestar, which is hugely popular in the premium segment. You would be very surprised to hear that actually the average price per unit of Chinese import is much, much higher than any other uh, export uh, exporter that we see on the market. So what we are seeing is basically European companies and the US, in the case of Tesla, um, who have actually treated China a little bit like Apple has treated Guangdong. It's a great production network. Uh, that's where Volkswagen produces ID6. Um, almost all of the Audi and Porsche, if you buy one of these today, you're basically buying a Chinese car. And BMW has outsourced its production of the British Mini. Imagine a British brand owned by Germans and engineered by Germans and made in China. That's globalization in a nutshell for you. And even Ford Explorer, when that reaches Europe, is probably going to be built on a platform that has been developed in China by Volkswagen. So in a sense, you can say that Europe is looking at China more like Europe looked to the US market. 
Europe went to the US, learned how to build SUVs and built them there. And actually, if you buy an SUV in Europe today, made by, for example, BMW, they will be made in the United States, although we have a European mark slapped on top of it. And we see Volkswagen, for example, taking a corner of XPeng, which was announced, I think, yesterday or the day before, depending on which side of the dateline you're on. And in terms of market size, it is undeniable that China has caught up. Uh, the European market sales is about 11 million units per year, I think, and China is roughly the same. And the second largest uh, car brand in China is today Volkswagen. They sell over a million cars per year. And But if you look at Chinese marks and Chinese brands selling in Europe, it's roughly about 1,000 units per year. BYD and Xpeng together, maybe they reached 1,500 last year. We are talking about less than 0.1% of the market. So we are looking at a completely different relationship and also as a Swede, uh, we have a we had a very troubled relationship with Volvo. It's obviously a national champion for Europe. And it was run down to the ground under Ford ownership. And if you talk to an average Swede today, they'll talk as Geely as saviors. They actually understood the value of Volvo, invested in Volvo, and they were great cars and also the Polestar concept. But looking at Chinese market entry, as a real threat as Japan and Korea was, we are looking at something that looks much, much further down the line. So I think I'll stop there and I'm sure there are follow-up questions as well. Um, yeah, so one follow-up would be, how about for the auto parts industry? Because the EV market is going to completely change um, not only a battery for an engine, but the, the demand for other parts in a, in a combustion engine vehicle. The, how does that affect all the manufacturing and auto parts companies in Europe? And is that of concern? That's a really good question because, I mean, if you look at the European auto industry, actually the actual OEM manufacturer accounts for about half of the jobs, other half of the, the other half, and actually the real value and engineering is not in the assembly. It's actually in the parts and supply industry, right? And where we can see there is, uh, well, it's not just half of the jobs. It's also a lot of the SMEs that forms the sort of the, what the Germans call the Mittelstand, the, the mill economy. And uh, that uh, subcontract and supply industry is being wiped out in the, the record short time. I mean, Europe overemphasized and over specialized in combustion engines. It made into a, basically a fine art. I mean, if you look at the last generation of petroleum engines, they are fine precision instruments. And we also overinvested in diesels. And if you look at a, well, an, a reasonably advanced EV, what you're basically looking at, I, I apologize to anyone who's in the EV industry, but they are not that much more sophisticated and a very advanced sewing machine with a huge battery and a little bit of nice AI and self-driving features that battery works slapped onto it. So anyone can actually manufacture a, an EV because it doesn't actually have a real power drive. It doesn't actually have a clutch, it doesn't have a transmission, all the stuff that actually Germans and the French actually spent decades specializing. And what we're seeing now is perhaps the fastest deindustrialization in the history of the West. If you don't know necessarily need a, let's say, a power drive, you don't need a transmission, you don't need all these mechanical parts, well, basically, it's being shut down in record time, in less than 10 years. And I've met people from the supply industry coming up and say that, well, you know, we ran this uh, as a family business, thousand employees uh, for four generations. And actually we went for a record profit to basically shutting down the factory in less than five years. It's amazing. Um, before I move to our next panelist, just one question for you based on your, your previous answer. Um, you seem to indicate that there's not, that, that Europe is viewing the Chinese imports differently than the United States. Um, we have read in a number of, of different reports coming out of Europe 
that there may be some differences of views in particular between the German auto industry and the French auto industry with the French possibly asking to look for, for looking to anti-dumping or countervailing duties as a way to address um, some of their concerns with, with imports from China. Is that overblown or is that, is that a real discussion going on? Well, let me put it like this. I mean, it's true that French and Italian conglomerates, uh, we're talking about PSA, Renault, and also we're looking at uh, the, uh, the, the, the Fiat group, they have been rather late to embrace electrification, and which also means that they need white label manufacturing in China in a very different way. Uh, it's more likely a product of internal competition, let's say between some of these groups who are not very happy about getting ahead uh, on the EV market with a cooperation of the Chinese. So it's not necessarily targeted at China itself. And also, I mean, I saw the rumors myself and uh, I speak to people in Brussels on a daily basis. That's what I do for work. But it's more like to, likely to have been uh, a product of, let's say, internal politics where we knew that Germans were actually talking bilaterally with Beijing authorities in regards to further industrial cooperation ahead of the summit that took place a month ago and where some people in Brussels and certain member states were actually not very happy about cutting a side deal. So when push came to shove and actually um, people expected an anti-dumping case to be filed, it never really materialized. And which basically shows all of the European players are actually dependent on China as a, well, as a supply chain and a subcontractor more than anything else. And uh, to put it in a also slightly different way, I can also say in addition to China, there's a lot of concerns about the downstream effects of US subsidies in the IRA, and uh, that we are probably looking at some kind of a trade remedy being introduced to one or maybe both economies, both China and United States, where Europe is starting to feel a little bit cornered. And uh, we subsidized consumers and the buyers of the, these cars. And of course, we did auto bailouts just like anyone else. But what we realized in hindsight is that, oh my God, we were not just passive. We were not just looking the other way. We actually subsidized the killing of our own auto industry. And everything was basically, all the values were actually, uh, all the value on the supply chains were actually moved to China. And yeah, there will be some kind of corrective. The question is when that will happen. Okay, let me move on now to Brian. Um, can you just give us a sense of where the administration stands on this issue? Is the administration concerned with trends in the sector, particularly given some of the state support that helped prop up and develop um, China's EV industry? Yeah, it's exactly right. We are concerned. You know, I thought Michael gave a very sobering assessment of China's position at the moment um, in, the, in EVs, but also, of course, in uh, upstream uh, battery technology, as well as the extraction and refining of critical minerals. Um, so, you know, we are concerned this is a sector in the United States that has a long history, both autos and auto parts, uh, of, of jobs, of good paying jobs, often union jobs, often jobs for folks without a college degree. Uh, so threats to that uh, are taken seriously, and in this case, you know there there is a potential looming threat because uh, China has achieved its position, as you as you reference, uh, through its you know industrial targeting of the sector. This is another sector in which China has set out ambitious goals for domination, both to dominate its own market and eventually uh, set you know specific quantitative metrics uh, for exports. That will cause serious uh, harm. And, you know, it's, it's a bit more on this industrial targeting because oftentimes, and I think the announcement for this panel even refers to subsidies. Um, but what people are referring to as subsidies, which is normal because it's kind of what we're familiar with in our systems, um, doesn't begin to scratch the surface of the way that China intervenes to build up its position in the strategic, uh, often technologically advanced sectors. Talking about things like government direction of companies. 
non-commercial behavior of SOEs, forced technology transfer, regulatory discrimination, uh, other forms of just non-transparent uh, discrimination. Uh, you know, in this case, obviously, for for many years, you had uh, legal specially produced batteries. They're the only batteries that were available in license for decided they weren't the leading producers of design uh, battery technology. Non-market lending, procurement, you had uh, GV requirements for a long time prior to testing, investment protection requirements. Then obviously there's always the labor and environmental concerns that come down the So when you put all of these things together, it's a, it's a very formidable challenge. Uh, and again, as, you know, go, going back to sort of getting my comments, it's one that, that represents a real threat of harm that we've seen in the past. Uh, to American workers, it is allowed to workers uh, in Europe and other market economies. Is, is, does the administration view the current um, barriers to China, um, including the 27.5% tariff and the consumer tax credit, as being kind of sufficient ways to kind of head off an onslaught of Chinese homegrown vehicles? Or is consideration being given to what further steps may be needed as the um, as the as trade develops? Uh, a lot of market penetration in the United States yet. Although I would also note that we have learned from past experience that if you wait for sort of a flood of imports to swamp the market, uh, you will experience a certain amount of harm immediately, and it also becomes much more difficult to defend against that type of behavior. So we do want to be out ahead of these things. Um, as I think another uh, speaker referenced, we do have, as by virtue of the Section 301 tariffs, a 25% tariff on autos, when you put that on top of the 2.5% uh, MFN tariff, the 27.5% tariff, that's obviously a point of distinction between our market and the EU market, where I think their tariff on autos is, is 10%. Um, so there is a certain level uh, of defense there, uh, but we will obviously continue to to assess the challenges. We are, you know, vigilant to threat, and we'll uh, we will take those off the table. We will we will take responses as necessary to to meet the challenges of defending workers against unfair trade. USTR is currently undertaking uh, its Section three hundred one review of the Trump China tariffs. Are issues like this being explored as um, as maybe potential um, path for rebalancing tariffs? raising tariffs on certain products while lowering or eliminating them on other products, keeping the overall balance the same. Yeah, so the, the ongoing four-year review is a comprehensive review of the actions that are taken under Section 301. This, of course, is in response to the forced technology transfer and other IP-related uh, unfair practices. Um, it will be a comprehensive review that, of course, includes uh, EVs, it includes EV batteries, it includes critical minerals, anything that has a tariff line. Um, it is currently subject to tariffs, uh, would be under review, as well as uh, the statute directs us to uh, consider actions that could be taken, that are not taken. The public is given an opportunity to comment on this. Uh, there have been comments submitted to the public on these products, um, and so it will be part of the review. Obviously, I'm not in a position today uh, to, to announce any outcomes, but when we make a determination, um, this certainly will be a part of it. And this review, and I'll, I'll, this is my last immediate question to you, this review has been going on for a long time. Um, are we likely to see it finalized in the months ahead? I think in the months ahead, yes. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to put a firm timeline on it, but we are, we think, uh, working productively. Obviously, a lot of public comments that were filed, there's a lot of tariff lines under the existing action um, that are covered, and we want to make sure that we get this right. So uh, we're, you know, we're doing this in a, in a thorough way, in a robust way, um, but we think within, uh, you know, a period of months, we, we would hope that we would reach a determination. So could you commit to say the fall? I don't think we want to commit here uh, to a very specific timeline, but uh, I think- I've been be in your a, shoes, I got it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now over to Jeff, and maybe you could be a little more candid now that you're on the outside. Um, can you just give us your sense um, of what kind of policy tools the U.S. has at its hands if it wanted to do more in this area to either, you know, one approach is to keep Chinese imports out, but another approach is basically to further incentivize production in the United States. So I'd be interested, when you look at the arsenal of trade laws and, and other ways to incentivize domestic production, 
what more could be done or do you think we're getting it right now? Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, you know, like you said, um, there are those two distinct categories of tools. One category targeting China and Chinese imports and Chinese companies, um, and the other geared to promoting U.S. productive capacity and technological leadership and access to raw materials. Um, and so it's important to pursue both uh, at the same time. <clears throat> And a third category of tool is international agreements. Um, the more that the United States can work with its partners and allies to present a united front, um, to expand our shared market, um, and to adopt common tools to counteract China, the more effective we'll be. Um, so, but back to kind of where you started, uh, the tools that target China, you know, we we often, when I was in the administration, we often cataloged the tools um, that you can use to restrict imports, and there are really a lot of them uh, at the disposal of the administration, and they don't require um, uh, most often congressional action. Um, Section 301, which we were just talking about, obviously is a very flexible tool that USTR has, um, and it has a lot of discretion to determine both the particular goods that are targeted by tariffs and the tariff levels. So, um, you know, Brian just said that USTR is mindful of the EV industry as it conducts this review. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether there are changes to the EVs and EV components coming out of that. Um, there, are, there are other tools too, uh, Section 232, National Security Tariffs or National Security Adjustments to Imports comes to mind, another very flexible tool um, there has to be a nexus to national security. In this industry, arguably, there is one. Uh, and um, uh, again, there's a lot of flexibility and discretion to the administration in structuring the remedy there. There's flexibility there, but that's an MFN statute. In other words, it, it generally applies to all imports, correct? I think there's more flexibility there for the administration. Um, if it wanted to have a more narrowly targeted uh, remedy, it could. Um, although it, it was it was used that way in the context of uh, you know steel and aluminum, for example. Um, uh, although again, even even there, right, there are exceptions for for uh, different countries. Um, Anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Want to touch on that because it, it came up already. You know, from my perspective, and it, this is a topic you know near and dear to my heart. But as a tool of industrial policy, it is a bit cumbersome. Uh, there's less discretion for the administration. There's, uh, you know, an elaborate system of rules that governs the application of anti-dumping accountability duties. There's um, a, a judicial review for all the decisions, and that judicial review is often searching. Um, and there is a requirement to get a determination by an independent agency, the International Trade Commission, which is not in the chain of command uh, of the executive branch. Um, uh, the, the chain of command reporting to the president. So, um, you know, for all those reasons, ABCBD is a possibility. I would guess that the administration has thought about um, the use of ABCBDs in the sector, whether, you know, in response to a petition or self-initiation, um, but I, I think it is more cumbersome as an industrial policy tool. I yeah, also just want to mention- ask, just yeah. to follow up on that, is it also complicated by the fact, and this is what Michael said in the beginning, like they're just, China's really, at this point, these companies are not exporting these, these cars to the United States. Um, well, um, that that is a legal, it's more of a legal problem in the ADCBD context than in the other context that I mentioned. So I think that, you know, while it's not, certainly not impossible to establish ADCVDs when there are no imports. Um, it's it's not it's not typical. Volvos on the on the ground here in the United States are coming from China and they'll bring more. So uh, with, with the Polestar, the the Geely Pol Polestar plant are being manufactured in South Carolina too, uh, with yeah. more to come. So and, there's a bit of an exception. Wendy, I just want to go back to an earlier question you asked. What are the dynamics inside China that are, are feeding this trend? Like if we think about China as an exporter of vehicles. Really, it's been explosive in the last couple of years. As recently as 2020, China exported less than a million cars. 
This year, it could be up to 4 million. What's going on? Well, the domestic market in China has slowed dramatically. So the golden years of growth and profits for car making and car selling inside China are basically over. They're over for the global joint ventures. They're over, over for the Chinese companies too. So there's enormous pressure on the factories, north, south, east, and west in China to push those products out. And most of those products today are going to developing markets, Southeast Asia, Africa, Middle East, South America, as I mentioned. Uh, but it's, there's no question that Chinese automakers are saying, we're sitting on large, practically half the world's capacity for making vehicles. We've got to find new markets for them into Europe, into the United States. So there's enormous new push out of China. This wasn't the case up until very recently. So that's one big change, new reality for us. The other, of course, is that US-China relations are at their worst in, what, 50 years. So what do you do? Do you say, oh, that's fine. Uh, you're competitively priced. Come on in. Or do you say, no, we want you to invest in our country. No, we don't. Actually, we don't want you to invest in our supply chains here. We want to handle them ourselves. So I think it's even larger than tariff rates. So we're talking about geopolitical strategy. Like, how do we compete? Um, and then this is just a channel for deciding how that'll play out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I'd like to just step in here yeah. and say that I really agree with Michael what he said about consolidation coming to the Chinese EV market. There's clear case of, I mean, all the market signals are there in terms of, uh, well, overcapacity over capacity is coming up. And uh, but I'd like to just point out something that there is, as as he was pointing out, there are different EV markets, and not everyone is fit for export orientation. One of the reasons why we only seen thousand units of Xpeng and uh, BYD so far is simply because that the Chinese EVs that you see in the domestic market is vastly different than ones that we see actually in Europe or the United States. They may, maybe, maybe not, they might be fit for Middle East or let's say Sub-Sahara, but I mean, if I look at Europe and the United States, we need something that runs at least 250 miles and it's usually an SUV. And that's not what a Chinese EV looks like. And we are looking at daily commute of few, you know, 10, 20 kilometers, uh, sorry, miles, uh, much smaller capacity. And uh, as we said, I mean, they are all SOEs in China, more or less, with the exception of Geely, which means that there will be some kind of consolidation uh, unless you manage to switch to export orientation, which so far no one has been able to do. Michael, a number of um, Chinese car companies have announced plans or in the process of investing in other countries, including Thailand, um, the Mideast, um, and other locations. Um, is, is that a trend you think we'll see? And then, Brian, maybe I can then turn to you and, and, and ask you, does that is that being um, considered by the administration? In other words, that 27.5% tariff would no longer be applicable if these cars were um, assembled um, with proper origin um, requirements met and then exported from those locations to the United States. Wendy, that's such, a, such an important point you raised because yes, we're already seeing investments into Vietnam BYD is going to be into Thailand. They're already manufacturing. Thailand. Hey, Thailand's our friend. So is it a workaround? And as soon as the Chinese see these tariffs, they say, what's our, what's our workaround? Just being realistic business people. So that is the reality. We are seeing record investments in many markets across the world by Chinese automakers with the option not only to supply that one market where they're manufacturing, but to use it as a hub for re-export to to markets like the United States. So that's a reality. That's something. And are those factories online now? Or are they still in the process of, of getting um, getting up to production levels? Uh, in Thailand, those are online today. Manufacturing, SAIC is manufacturing in Thailand, as is Great Wall. Um, in, in Vietnam, it's in the application registration. It's early days. Uh, Indonesia, they're doing some local assembly and some imports. So each country is different, but the trend is the Chinese auto manufacturers say, if we can ship from China, great, we're going to do that first, first option. If there's tariff barriers, better to manufacture in country. All right, we'll make the investment, do final assembly there. And hey, we might be able to use it as a base to export to third countries, just as you suggest. So 
And how about Mexico? Mexico, absolutely. There's dozens and dozens of Chinese companies, not only the automakers, but also suppliers now very active in Mexico, setting up uh, operations there. Absolutely. Big trend. Brian, anything to um, you can share with us here? I would say, you know, part of the problem is over dependence on China, right? Because and, and that, that applies to the EVs and as well to these sort of upstream technologies and, and critical minerals. Um, and so that's why you see a push from us to make sure that we are building out more robust supply chains. So I think without commenting on any particular situation, part of what we would try to assess is our investments that they're making elsewhere. Um, part of just sort of normal commercial activity, or does it represent a threat that is under sort of the thumb of the Chinese government in a way that makes us, that, that contributes to that dependency? Um, and, in, in, you know, for certainly for the, ca the case now, and, and we think uh, potentially going forward, represents a, a risk to us. So I think that's sort of how we would view those types of, of situations. Mm -hmm. uh, just to jump in with one very simple example, but there's a tire company out of China, one of the leading tire manufacturers, Three years ago, they built a manufacturing facility in Vietnam. The Vietnamese market's not that big. I said, why did you do this? You have plenty of capacity in China. Why did you set up in Vietnam? Oh, for the U.S. market. Done. So it's, it's, it's real. It's happening. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can, before we turn to audience questions, I can get in one more question. Um, and I'll turn this over. I'll, I'll start with Jeff, but I welcome others. Um, and that's all a question of these cars and data. And, you know, we have heard of, of data concerns. In fact, China has already restricted Tesla's operations in certain kind of sensitive areas of, of their country. Um, but, you know, these EVs, a lot of software, um, you have GPS, you have sensors. Um, in some ways, they're kind of a data machine. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff, do you think there's any, what, how, how do you view this? And do you think that there are like policy concerns with respect to EVs when we look at, you know, some of the discussions on TikTok and other data related um, concerns that are being um, debated in Congress and in the White House? There certainly are. Um, there are a lot of concerns with respect to this sector and other sectors where there's the potential for data to fall into the hands of foreign adversaries or bad actors um, that aren't governments. Um, and, you know, I think it's, as you said, it's an issue with respect to EVs. It's particularly an issue with respect to autonomous vehicles, right? Because they have highly advanced um, hardware and software that collect and process data about the vehicle's surrounding environment, just a tremendous quantity of data um, that they suck up. Um, and so, yes, I think this is a significant concern for policymakers, and I wouldn't be surprised if there is um, regulatory and legislative activity in this area. Okay, I think we're going to turn it over to Ken, so you can turn it over to the audience. Thanks so much. This has been incredibly informative so far. And I have to say the questions are really detailed. Um, I'm probably going to read a few of them directly. And I usually try to bunch a few, but a few, um, Hosuk, I think I'm going to direct a couple of these in your direction because there's several questions about um, the EU's current legal framework. This one says fit for 55, proposed battery regulation, critical minerals act. Um, you know, is there enough to address the dependency on EV components and key materials from China? Um, and I think we can address, we can also combine that with uh, how you know, what are you hearing about US EU talks about uh, batteries and uh, uh, some sort of battery agreements or electrical vehicle agreements that might be able to reach between the United States and uh, Europe on the batteries, which is such, you know, as you were saying yourself, uh, there's so few components in these electric vehicles, but the, the batteries are the big one. And so, you know, where are we seeing uh, possible opportunities for collaboration there? Well, I'll start by saying that, uh, first of all, that I think Europe is catching up reasonably well uh, on the battery technology. I mean, this, we have companies like Northvolt coming out of Sweden uh, that has now become sort of a preferred supplier to the Volkswagen Group. And what we are seeing now, it's not so much of a territory territorial competition between jurisdictions, between countries of the geopolitical kind, but more of a competition between, let's say, firm to firm. 
So for example, Volkswagen that I've mentioned several times, which basically built the Chinese auto industry in many ways, uh, taught them how to build cars. Uh, I mean, they have now told uh, Northvolt, the, one of the big players here in Europe, that we want you to build factories here in Europe, but you can only supply Volkswagen. And considering that a lot of Scandinavian subsidy went into actually building Northvolt, obviously they are seriously, seriously concerned about such advanced purchase agreement. I mean, this is the kind of um, firm to firm competition that we are looking at. Uh, and of course, I mean, um, our political masters have reason to be concerned. Uh, I mentioned the IRA here that, I mean, if I listen around in Brussels, I think people are equally concerned about IRA as Chinese subsidies at the moment. Um, this is basically the zeitgeist in Europe overall. And um, yeah, so firm to firm and no real sense of, let's say, transatlantic cooperation, because to, let's be fair. I mean, we have always been fair competitors. We agreed on the rules, but we've always been commercial competitors. And when we can stab each other on the back, we have never shied away from that either. <laughs> um, that's my old years in trade talking. But um, also, I just want to mention another thing, because I don't want to paint a too rosy picture about collaboration with China, because one of the things that we are really missing out here is reciprocation. And yes, we do have a reasonable market share in China, and China is obviously a large growing market. But even in certain sense, I mean, uh, as Jeff was talking about data, um, it takes one to know one, I guess, but China doesn't allow us to put European radio units in our cars. So all the European cars actually sold in China has Huawei antennas in them because China consider all geospatial information. We're talking about hardware. We're not even talking about software. We're not even talking about data. We are talking actually about the antenna. You're actually not allowed to have a European antenna, a 5G unit or 4G unit inside a European car sold in China. And if you think about... Uh, I. I don't want to open up my Tesla and see where my radio unit, my Tesla what Model Y comes from. I know it's horrible. I drive a Chinese car, uh, but it's um, yeah, it is. Um, I'm pretty damn sure that we are looking at components coming out of the Chinese supply chain. Uh, that's that's for sure. And uh, on this uh, environmental targets, I think we are seeing now not just in France, as I mentioned, but also in Germany that we subsidized on our own supply chain death. We premediated even its date of death, 2035, and realized a little bit too late and too little too late perhaps that, well, maybe petroleum wasn't such a bad idea. And if you look at actually the carbon footprint of some of the petroleum cars, it's actually quite reasonable. And there are some ideas about, okay, why why can't we let some part of this industry survive? And German industry had been advocating something called e-fuels. So if we have, an, if we actually manage to invent net zero fuels, basically net zero gas, then maybe we can continue producing petroleum. And here's where the European industrial Soviet logic sometimes fails. The thing is that the, the European oil industry is not really interested in making those e-fuels as we call them. So basically, we, as I said before, we did perhaps a little bit too much, subsidized things in a little bit in the wrong way. And the result is that the China managed to leapfrog really into the next generation of cars. And we helped them basically uh, take over the industry. And to be fair, I mean, if you talk to, to some sustainability experts, they will tell you that EV is really not the future. I mean, if you look at the energy mix of some of the European countries, if you drive a one kilometer or one mile on an EV, you would have the same carbon footprint as a petroleum car, simply because the energy mix in electricity production in some of these countries is actually way worse than oil. And some of that, as you know, would come from countries that are really, really unsavory from a lot of reasons uh, in the same way that we find China sometimes unpalatable. 
And uh, from that reason, I think perhaps that we should have looked to the next next generation, the next big thing, which is hydrogen. And uh, that conversation is certainly going to take place. And uh, then we'll be looking to the United States again. Right. Uh, well, thank you, Hasuk. There's, there's so many things to unpack here, um, but we're going to, I want to, I think we, we need to shift away from some of that to uh, some, some I want to jump in a couple, Jeff, uh, direct to you, maybe a couple trade law questions that have come in. Um, there are a couple that, that kind of play off each other. First one has to do about Chinese investment in Mexico and a way of being getting around some of the tariffs and also maybe qualifying for some of the benefits under the US MCA. But then second question comes in about um, you know, whether the administration might consider revising and updating what substantial transformation means. I know this is a really wonky topic for our trade uh, lawyer types out there, but is that a way to address Chinese investments in third countries? Okay. Um, perhaps <laughs> there is, I mean, the, 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 the rules on rules of origin are constrained um, by by statute, by international agreements. So, um, you know, there's not a uh, tremendous scope for, you know, uh, uh, tremendous room for maneuver there on the part of, of the administration, especially acting without Congress. Um, but maybe, you know, some subtle shifts in the way that the law is enforced are possible and may actually even be underway um, to try to address situations where there's perceived circumvention, for example, of Section 301 tariffs. Um, and I guess I make a similar point in response to the first question. You know, there, there are tools available under the law, uh, particularly in the ADCBD context for addressing circumvention. And one of the types of circumvention that's described in the statute is where, you know, a product is um, just completed or assembled uh, through a process that's minor and significant in a third country like Mexico, uh, and then imported into the United States. So there, there are you know there are tools available. Um, uh, they they don't cover every situation. I think probably that the person asking the question has in mind, um, and the tools for addressing circumvention you know perhaps um, could use some freshening up. Um, but um, but there are you know there there are some tools available. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I suspect over time in this industry, as has been the case in other industries, there'll be a bit of cat and mouse, you know, um, there'll be production shifting to different countries, there will be um, attempts to use different uh, tools in different ways uh, to try to get at uh, the perceived problem. Um, and, um, you know, uh, oftentimes, at least historically, the best that trade trade policy and trade remedies have been able to do is to sort of slow down um, the advance of the foreign players, particularly Chinese players, um, not really to stop them in the tracks. So if I might, Jeff and, and Brian, you might want to weigh in or, or not, depending on how you feel about these two questions, but there's a couple, there's other U.S. trade law tools that are out there um, and things that might be considered. Some of them, uh, certainly, Brian, are not USTR's purview necessarily, but you know, uh, one question is how will the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act impact Chinese EVs or upstream supplies of batteries imported into the US? Um, is this a tool that could be deployed or, or might be triggered uh, by uh, potential Chinese imports? And then, you know, there's licensing questions too. There's this uh, Ford licensing deal with Chinese battery maker that's gotten a lot of attention in Michigan. Um, is this a good way? Is there, are there, but there might be, there may be moves underway, including in Congress to uh, forbid these, some of these kind of deals. Anyone? Brian, do you want to take a stab or do you want, when, when, when do you, <laughs> should I go? Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you start, Jeff, and Brian, jump in when you're ready. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess on, on the first question, I, what I would say is you know, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is part of a statutory scheme to target forced labor for any product. If it's a product of forced labor, it shouldn't be imported, and there's a general ban on the importation of that kind of product. It's not really, I don't view that as a tool of industrial policy. 
um, uh, it's, it's simply, you know, a question of whether there's a link to, to forced labor. Um, and, you know, it, and so the answer to the question is to the extent that there's a connection between a particularly a particular Chinese company and, and forced labor practices, uh, it would affect them. But to the extent there isn't, it shouldn't either. Um, so I don't think that that's part of the sort of industrial policy questions that, that, we're, that we're grappling with here. Um, uh, remind me, what was the second point? Oh, Ford. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of congressional interest in Ford and its partnership uh, with a Chinese company. Um, I, I think it's just unclear at this point where it's going to go. Um, I, I did want to note that there was a provision in the House version of the NDAA passed last month which, which banned um, DOD procurement from certain um, Chinese-related uh, battery companies, banned the procurement of battery technologies from them. Um, so that may be one direction that the uh, that Congress decides to go in. Um, but um, I'm sure that there's still a lot of deliberation underway about other, um, you know, other other ways to make sure that any type of partnership like that is in American interests. So, you know, I think it's not a foregone conclusion that it's inconsistent with American interests. It depends on what's going on with technology, who's getting a technology, and um, how the transaction is structured. Brian, anything to jump in on on these other trade law questions? Yeah, so uh, you know, obviously, don't want to impinge on uh, what was referenced as uh, or CBP DHS equities here on UFLPA, but. Um, uh, I think Jeff is right that the contours of that are relatively clear. And if this touches, if it, it auto's not special, if anything touches, you know, touches for, uh, forced labor, then we're prohibited from importing it into the United States and we will enforce the law. Um, on the second question, don't want to comment on any particular companies or situations and certainly won't hazard a guess as to what uh, Congress is going to do. What I would say is, I go again to, you know, we are very concerned about uh, being in a position of over-dependence. So uh, we, we simply cannot rely on China, both for the EV, for EVs as well as for the upstream the battery technology, critical minerals. We will look at that uh, and, and make sure that we have, that we are, are not reliant on China for what we think, again, it's a core manufacturing sector, but also we should definitely point out these are the critical technologies and products for meeting our Paris Agreement goals, right? They're incredibly important for the transition to a clean energy economy. So we will not be, uh, we cannot allow ourselves to be over-reliant on China for this good. That being said, we are not decoupling from China. We're not seeking to er erect some sort of barrier that creates two completely separate, separate ecosystems. So I don't want to, you know, overstate here, um, the case, but but we will of course pay attention to to looming threats that result in risk from over dependence. Thank you, Brian. I, I would expect nothing less. Um, you know, we we're hitting our hour, but I want to just direct two last questions to Michael and Hosuk. Um, we've got a few that have come in. I'm just going to try to bunch them real quick. Um, has one has to do with the EU. Uh, um, the electrification of the EU grid and 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 being able to actually get as many of these kind of electric vehicles on the road in the EU, you know, what is uh, what can be done to to bring more charging stations, uh, lowering EV purchasing costs, et cetera, in the EU, um, you know, is uh, is hydrogen a real possibility? Um, and 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 you know, for for the market, and then as well, um, you know, our our um, Chinese EVs going to be able to meet safety standards, uh, very high safety standards that have been set in the US uh, and elsewhere uh, in the future, or now. Michael, you wanna start first, I guess? You're unmuted. Uh, right, uh, so very quickly, I do feel just to go back to CATL and Ford deal, that's a hugely significant test case for the United States government hugely significant because on the one hand ford saying we need the lfp chemistry the chinese have a monopoly on that that'll allow us to reduce the cost of our cars from a commercial perspective it makes all the sense in the world on the other hand from a national security perspective do you really want to have china's number one battery maker as your key supplier for your industry in michigan that, that, that's a big decision. It's not some, oh yeah, we can work this out. It's a decision to be made. So that's watching very closely how that works out. With regard to the second question about 
Chinese ability to meet safety standards, certainly the most advanced Chinese cars that they're developing today from BYD, the ones I re referenced earlier, $70,000, $80,000 from NEO. These are world-class cars. Yes, they can at the top end. Most of the EVs that China sells domestically and for export are in a different class, the ones that probably would not qualify and meet safety standards here in the United States. So you've got a tale of two industries, if you will. You've got high end and you've got the rest. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Hosuk, any last thoughts on some of those questions about uh, European electrification? Well, I would like to start on the question of safety standards, because we have a type approval system here in Europe, and we have type certifications, basically a self-certification system in the United States based on FMVS. And a small anecdote, perhaps, is that US-made Teslas couldn't actually pass European uh, safety standards and most of all, quality assurance. So, which means that actually they had to supply from Shanghai in order to meet European quality and safety standards. And if you look at, well, Cybertruck, which is Tesla's next big thing, uh, has to be redesigned completely in order to basically uh, pass the hurdle in Europe. And I, if I'm going to put my money on something, I'm just going to say I don't think they're going to be made in the United States. At least the one, well, the ones that are going to be sold in Europe is not going to be made in the United States. I'm actually a trade geek, so I shouldn't actually really talk about, you know, the electrification grids and so forth. But I can tell, add something, which is that sub, we have two different models of subsidization. United States and China has subsidized manufacturers, whereas Europeans have so far traditionally subsidized consumers. And as I said, it has played out horribly against the European supply chains because it basically benefited the Chinese. But one thing I will add here is that Europe has also been very keen on having open non-proprietary systems. So for example, uh, Tesla superchargers were forced to be opened up in order to qualify for European subsidies. And, and so forth. And the big winner here is not actually necessarily European marks that have made their cars in China, but the big winners were actually the Koreans. If you look at Kia and Hyundai, which belongs to the same corporate group, they have taken huge strides into the European market and thanks to an early adaptation of um, elect electrical vehicles. In addition, of course, they have benefited hugely from the uh, EU Korea FTA uh, with the duty free access. And in addition, they invested 100 million plus in Eastern Europe, where they are actually manufacturing some of these EVs and the, uh, the final assembly takes place. So I think it's a combination of both supply chains as well as well technology, as we talked about. It's not all about China. But I, what we can see here is really the lesson learned in terms of unless you know what you're doing in trade policy in tandem with industrial policy, it could have really unintended consequences. And what I just told you about Tesla quality assurance versus in the United States versus China tells you a little bit about where the land is, so to speak. But but the most important part is that the design and actually the software still very much come from the United States. And that's where you, China still can't catch up. European manufacturer has partnered with, let's say, uh, play, players like Baidu to develop self-driving cars because they were more actually afraid of Google and Apple than uh, the Chinese Communist Party. I'm not going to comment on whether that's good or bad. I mean, I'll leave, leave that to the listeners. But these projects have been sort of left behind and where the Europeans are now actually developing their own self-driving technology. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very, very much. Really appreciate all the uh, deep thought you all have given to these issues and for sharing some of that with our audience today. And we've gone a little bit over and I apologize to our viewers for that. Wendy, any final words before we, we sign off? You're muted, Wendy. It always happens once on one on our webinars. A big thanks to our panelists. And I think this is a topic where I think future webinars would be useful. I feel like we just scratched the surface. We absolutely. And we are doing a trade environment series. We have been for the past three or four years, actually. We will continue 
various aspects of this conversation. Love to have all of you back on. Really grateful to you for being with us. And Wendy, my, my frequent partner in these events, thank you so much for joining us. Brian, Hasuk, Michael, and Jeff, thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, take care, everyone. Be well and thank you. And we'll pass along the questions, by the way, to our speakers. So if we didn't get to yours or we didn't address it specifically, they'll get to see uh, who asked them and what was asked. Thanks very much.